Hi, and welcome to the Future of Dermatology podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Farah Kamengar, board certified dermatologist. We are here to talk about anything and everything dermatology related. You'll hear from me and my guests who are dermatologists, physicians, experts, scientists, residents, and medical students in the field of dermatology. We publish weekly, so if you like what you hear, hit that subscribe button and show us some love, and thank you for joining us. I am so excited for today's episode. We have Pedram Abrari, who is a world expert on AI, large language models, and he has developed so many products over time, so much technology that has helped the world. Um, I'm very lucky to have worked with Pedram on DermGPT, a, a product everyone knows really, really well. And he is an expert. He has patents in this area. And it was really important for me to do this talk because a lot of the relationship between physicians and technology is a complicated one, as we know. And a lot a lot of that has traditionally been because all the products that were developed by engineers didn't necessarily make it to the physicians until much later in their um, kind of product life cycle. That's where our product was very different because you know we worked with physicians and doctors working together from the beginning. So it was really important for me to do an episode where we have doctors and engineers talking at the same time. So thank you, Petron, for yeah, joining me. Thank you, Farah, for having me. Absolutely, and Petron, you have an. I mean, it, it would probably take two hours just to talk about everything you've done, but just as a quick intro, I mean, of course, you're the chief um, technology officer at, at Permata. So you were, you were doing things at a very C-suite level and you have, you're overseeing lots of teams and you guys have multiple patents and you're actually, while AI story is uh, kind of uh, developing, you guys are building a lot of the large things that are uh, moving. Yeah. So if you want to tell us a little bit about yeah, it, your day to day. Yeah, so I'm I'm a serial entre- entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. I've um, uh, done a lot of different startups where I've tried to fix or address business challenges in the various domains. Currently, I'm focused on uh, AI-driven contract management. Um, interestingly, uh, contracts and lawyers are very similar to doctors in in the sense that um, there is um, you know there is a uh, a lot of kind of distrust of technology generally. Like, I don't know if I trust this thing. I think I can do my job better than uh, this technology can. Um, and, and you know, and the, the difference is, you know, that with generative AI in particular, um, it is a game-changing technology in that it has certain superpowers that generations before it, uh, even AI models before it, have never had. Um, and this superpower is also part of its strength uh, and also part of the fear factor around it. But there's also a lot of misunderstanding of what the technology is and what it can and cannot do. So um, large language models, you know, to, as a way of background, the way they were developed is they are uh, trained on neural networks. What neural networks are, are uh, basically a computer chips that simulate human brain neurons. And the interesting thing about large language models is that um, they were trained by passing massive amounts of data on the internet through these neural networks, but without actually trying to control how the, the network learns about these things. It just allowed, we allowed them to self-organize these, uh, these neural networks. And what the, the hope was that we would get a language understanding, machine-based language understanding. The surprise was that along with that language uh, understanding came intelligent behavior. Yeah. And nobody really to this day can explain how that intelligent behavior came about. Uh, in some ways, it is kind of similar to how human intelligence came about. You know, we learn, you know, when a baby is born, nobody really trains them. Right. As though, okay, this is Apple. This is like the, the input goes in and somehow the brain self-organizes. And over time, Intelligence is built on top of that. Intelligent behavior is problem solving is built on top of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we are seeing a similar pattern with large language models, where through the through the um, learning of language, uh, it starts to actually adopt and, and mimic human intelligence. Um, you know, how far will it go, and will it become superhuman, and will it will it be the world of Terminator? And <laughs> you know, th- there's a lot of there's a lot of fear and uncertainty around that. I I personally don't see that, at least not in the um, near future. But what I do see is a technology that has immense power, but also has shortcomings. 
Um, and, and it isn't an end all be all to all problems. Uh, it has to be, you have to understand its strengths and weaknesses, um, and figure out how to use it to really effectively help you, uh, you know, in, in contracts, uh, in, in, in legal world, as well as in medicine, I think these are two areas where, uh, they're both going to be heavily impacted, uh, with generative AI technology, um, whether we like it or not, <laughs> whether lawyers like it or not, whether doctors like it or not. Uh, the tsunami is coming. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, uh, are you going to be washed over by it or are you going to ride that wave? Um, and the, the sooner that uh, that lawyers and, and doctors learn about the technology and what it can do for them, the better off they'll be in terms of knowing what not to fear, knowing how to, how to leverage it, knowing uh, how to get a competitive advantage from it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's that's a fantastic overview, and and I completely agree with you with with uh, technology and physicians. The way it turned out is a lot of the initial technology was with their um, electronic medical records yeah. that were kind of like handed to us before around like 2016 ish, and then there was that large adoption. I remember the day electronic medical records came out on one of the rotations I was on at UCSF. There were physicians who were, who were giants in these fields and written the textbooks. They were so nervous, so <laughs> retired. <laughs> this has been the response to technology. And so just to set the background of, of why there's so much mistrust. And I think the difference was also that a lot of those products were not made with the physician in mind. They were made to solve the problem of coding, maybe, right. or like different things. And they slowed down the physician right. brains. So we had to click all this stuff and it slowed us down. Whereas AI now, I think, is not only as fast as us, but probably faster yeah. as well. So now I think AI is can solve all these problems, but this historic mistrust has, has happened. Yeah. And then also there is that little fear people have of, are the Terminator robots going to take over? It was funny in my in the office the other day, I was telling my medical assistants, I was like, how cool would it be in a couple of years if we get a couple of those Tesla um, robots that they, that they mm -hmm. uh, demoed? And we could teach them simple things like setting up biopsies and things like that. In my head, I'm like, that is so cool. And I could just see my my medical assistants in their eyes. They're like, that is not cool. That is terrible. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if I were a patient person. and I saw that robot coming to try to examine me, I, I'd be like, what if this thing goes crazy and starts to choke me? You know, there like, is the fear. There, there is the fear factor. Of course, you know, it, you know, you also have these robot taxis and things like that where but people, people have adopted them. It, it's slowly, it's slow, it's slow but true. it's sooner or later. Yes, everybody will get used to it, right? Yeah. Sooner or later, they will be everywhere. Sooner or later, you will start to trust them. That's true. And just when they gain your trust, and when they strike, no, nope. yeah. <laughs> that's when they strike. I've seen people in Waymos. I asked, I asked my friends once. I was like, why does a single person sit in the front seat? Next to the Waymo, like they're just thinking, what if the thing goes crazy? I'm gonna cry. Yeah, right? so if you look at the patterns, half sit in the back comfortably. Why do they even have wheels? Why do they, why do they even need that? But yeah, it's true. So there's so much that goes into it. And I think one of the things you are so great at, at which I think probably 99.9% .9 of engineers are not great at, is bridging that cap gap. I think you always say, like, is it the bridging the, the chasm where you have yeah, right. yeah, so the, the, the challenges the people you're building for? And yeah, precisely. So on for better or worse, engineers tend to think like engineers, mm -hmm. right? Um, and when they try to solve a business problem, regardless of what the business domain is, they try to solve it from their perspective. Um, this is where, you know, you really need good product designers and product managers and so on to really get in the shoes of the end user and solve it from their perspective. Like, you know, what's the point of building a technology if it's never going to get adopted? Um, you know, and I think... One of the, and a big challenge with, with traditional technology has been the user experience, right? The UI, the clicking, the, yeah. you know, all of that, which is makes, makes life difficult, especially for somebody who doesn't deal with that on a DD basis, like electronic medical records, right? Whereas with generative AI and with large language models, especially um, when they understand, uh, they can listen to you, they can understand uh, what you're saying as well as a human can. And they can transcribe it and they can not only that, they can also um, on the fly interpret what's happening with your patient and maybe give you guidance as to, hey, these could be based on the patient history. These could be the source of the, the, the you know, and the symptoms that you're experiencing, they're experiencing now. These could be the top possible issues that they may be experiencing, right? And then maybe you want to ask these follow-up questions and then you ask those questions and then they kind of can really guide the, the, the doctor through a process of getting to the most uh, optical outcome, optimal outcome. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges in medicine has been that if you have a 
common problem where a lot of people have, and you can go to a specialist who specializes in that area, they can figure out your problem and solve it. If you have an uncommon problem, a rare disease, where nobody can figure it out, and how many times have we heard the story of, oh, I, I had to go to 20 different specialists, nobody can figure it out, They this one said it's that, that one said it's that, and nobody connected the dots. What you learn is a lot of, uh, there's you know, if you do some internet searches, you'll see a lot of people who have had these rare diseases mm -hmm. put their symptoms in ChatGPT or in Claude, and magically, this thing comes back and says, okay, this is the top five things. And then they go back to their doctors. And sure enough, it's like one of those things that no, no individual expert was able to figure out. Why is it that it's, it's able to do that? It's because it has broad knowledge across a lot of different expertise, domains of expertise in, in medicine. And it can connect the dots, um, whereas you cannot have that in one person. You know, you're a dermatologist. You cannot be an a, a expert in oncologist as well, right? right? You have some general training, but your specialization is dermatology. But imagine if you could have specializations in 20, 30 different everything in medicine in your brain, mm -hmm. how well could you connect the dots? Now, that doesn't mean that this will replace doctors by any stretch. No, Genevieve does its best to guess and, and make recommendations, but I don't see it replacing doctors anytime soon. That's good. Uh, because <laughs> you still, me, and there's also this challenge with hallucinations and it can sometimes make these very factual statements about something that is actually not true. And, and so those things are still there. Yeah. Uh, they can be managed with, you know, with data grounding and things like that, but uh, you can minimize the chance of those things, but you still need a person to make the final judgment. Right. However, the power that they bring to doctors is that they can bring you know even in your in your dermatology world how what is the percentage of the um overall knowledge in you know up-to-date knowledge in dermatology that you th you think you have at your fingertips when i came out of residency a lot and now 10 or 11 years in a lot less let's put it that way it's true but you, what's you the number keep... Let, let's say out of residency and let's say now what do you think is out of residency it's probably almost 100 percent because the boards make you remember every single minutia yeah. um i think what you gain out of residency now i'm really good at pattern recognition i think my skin exam has gotten really better like i can like the other day my claim to fame i think i diagnosed like a 0.8 millimeter di you know, melanoma, you just get to see, you see something and you're like, that doesn't look right. So mm -hmm. you develop certain skill sets, but you're right. If it's not your everyday thing, you're going to lose a little bit of, right. you know, if you put these few things together, it's this rare syndrome. So I remember you and I had an interesting, before we both built the GPT or maybe right when we were building it, I showed you how uh, we uploaded, I think it was the chat GPT, an image of I don't know if it was cancer or I think it was a basal cell. Yeah, we were we were playing around with dermatopathology, putting up derm slides yeah. on, onto the image base just to see. Just, just to see. see. And yeah. and and we This we, is what you, we do for fun. You uploaded you uploaded something that was common. Yep, it was like a nodule And, and immediately it detected it Indeed. accurately. That and then you say I said, once you find something that's rare, and we found an image online that was rare, we uploaded that. What happened then? I forget what did happen. Did it get it, it right? Detected it. it detected yeah, it. and you were shocked. I remember. Yeah, I remember your jaw show. was on the floor. It's like, yes. I how did it do that? I was shocked that the regular and this is not like a vector database built or anything. This was just general chat GPT. General chat GPT, not, not specialized, not specialized, not fine tuned. I thought because you know for histopathology, when you put a slide, you it just looks like a lot of times just like a pink glob of nothing, right? It almost looks like a little smear or like nail polish on a slide. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have no context, you don't even know what you're looking at. So I thought it was going to give me some basic idea or maybe pick up that this is a pathology and not only picked up this is skin but picked up exactly what it is which at that point i was like maybe i am going to be replaced <laughs> <laughs> so so that i mean is, it's crazy how i, how I, I still is. again i'm still a firm believer that it will become a huge assistant yes. right yeah i think this becomes the ultimate augmented. assistant yeah. uh, it, it's all going to augment your practice i don't think it's going to replace uh, doctors, uh, at least not anytime soon. Uh, unless and, you also and, have the robot that can do the biopsy. But unless then, you have the robot, but, yeah. but you know what usually happens though is you know all the waves of technology uh, in the past, and we'll talk about kind of technology adoption in a second. But every time a new technology comes to the forefront, there's a lot of people that fear it, like mm -hmm. oh, it's going to take my job, it's going to take my job, and right. so on. And you know, in some cases, it does. Like obviously, you know, robots and factories and things like that. Obviously, a lot less people are involved. Yeah. But in specialized areas, what usually happens is the technology makes 
things that are, um, you know, common things, easy mm -hmm. that would have been, you know, even though they're common, it's still hard to detect them, hard to diagnose them, hard to treat them. It makes those easy and it makes uncommon things possible right. to, to, to solve and to detect and to resolve. And, uh, and, and, and so each time you kind of go up one level, the level of expertise goes up further. So, oh, if I can do this easily, let me focus on this higher level disease. And if I can do that, and then I'm, let me focus on that disease. So I think what will happen is that it will lift all boats, That's right? True. So all the doctors who are specialized in various things can start focusing on new areas of ex expertise yes. and, and solve higher level problems because these lower level problems are being solved at, at a much wider scale with much higher, higher accuracy and so on. So I think overall patient care will improve but it isn't like we run out of diseases. Right? Yeah, that's right. So there's, there's always this next level yeah. thing that there's a lot of diseases out there that gain no attention today that's right. because there's no bandwidth. Yeah. This will create bandwidth for, uh, for research, for areas to go kind of into, into those areas. Uh, one, one thing I want to talk about the technology hype cycle. The, you know, every time a new technology comes to the forefront, um, there, Gartner has this hype cycle, uh, which starts out with, um, you know, the technology arrives and, it starts the you know it starts everybody expects everything in the universe for this technology to do, especially with AI, and then eventually it reaches the peak of inflated expectations, is what they call. It. It's like the the market realizes, wait a minute, it can't do everything I thought it would do, and then there's this level of letdown and disappointment where you know the market is disappointed in the technology, and then eventually hits a trough of disillusionment, which means okay, everybody's like, what the hell? Like this AI thing isn't it isn't as smart as I thought, and it hallucinates and it makes mistakes and so on. And then out of that comes this, um, uh, you come, come come out of that trough and you you reach this plateau of, create, uh, of productivity where the market figures out, all right, it's not everything I thought it was, but it isn't crap. Yeah. It isn't garbage. It can do certain things. This is where I can use it. And this is where I can get value. Uh, generative AI is kind of going through that trough of disillusionment currently. There is a lot of uh, uncertainty in the market, fear, uncertainty, doubt. And then, you know, anybody who has any fear, as soon as they hear a bad story, negative story, they latch onto it. Okay, I'm not, you know, this is it. Like, that's all I need to hear. And they they run away from it. But we will come out of that. And my guess is sometime in early 2025, we'll be out of it. And then people will realize really what they can do with this technology and how to use it and how to leverage it. You know, we've talked in your in the dermatology practice, there's a lot of mundane headache things that you guys have to deal with. Um, for example, you know, patient sends an email mm -hmm. asking some mundane question about the, if, and then you have to, or your, your team has to get on there and read it and respond to it and so on. For things that are like that, if you know the patient history, uh, you know what their problem is, um, you know what the, you know, read the question, you understand the question, you want to have the medical knowledge, you can reply to that using generative AI, and be very, very accurate, right? Because one thing it doesn't do, it doesn't get tired, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It may hallucinate from time to time, but it won't get tired, right? And, and so the, the, those responses can be ultra accurate and ultra specialized to that patient. Mm -hmm. Instead of it giving a general response because I'm tired to respond to this, uh, I can actually, this will be an actual very precise response to this particular patient's situation. So it's a, probably a lot more effective. That will solve a major headache for doctors, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that that's where a lot of my focus is is solving the like you said the really mundane pain in the butt <laughs> problems we have every day. When I give talks on AI, Derm GPT at the AED and other conferences, a lot of people ask about really high level stuff like, oh, what about the image based, let's say, diagnosis of like a melanoma, okay. you know, AI patterns, things like that, which we kind of touched upon too, because diagnostics is, is is another field that it's really good at. But to me, those are, and you can actually let me know your thoughts too on image based versus language models, which is what we're talking about. But um, to me, those are cool, but you know, we're not there yet. It's going to take a lot more work for a computer to be as good as a doctor and, you know, seeing it, seeing a melanoma diagnosing correctly. But we're totally there right now, probably past the their moment with large language models being able to solve these very everyday problems yep. of in-basket management, yep. where patients message you, prior authorization management. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many pain points in their practice. Prior authorization. Talk, so talk about prior authorization and what the pain that is. Okay. So I think if there's any physician listening to this, 
you know, as soon as you hear, I don't have to say, I don't have to finish it. Like I say prior awe and you know the pain. For anyone who's not a physician listening to this, of course, this is a process by which our large healthcare system is trying to figure out how do we pay for all these expensive medications. And so we have to do lots of rules and things in our in our chart note talking about a patient and their history and why we're justifying a medicine that we need. Then that process goes to a pharmacy and a prior authorization process. An insurance company can say, okay, here's your medicine. They might say no, denial. And then you might have to go back with a rebuttal. So it's a whole process where our nurses and MAs could be on a phone with an insurance company for two to three hours. As you can imagine, that's an expensive project. Then it comes back to the physician, okay, write us a letter. It's a very cumbersome project, but ultimately what who it hurts is the patient. So someone could be waiting two, three weeks to get a medicine, maybe never get the medicine if that process is And how often denied. when you, you know, especially for expensive medicine, how often is it rejected usually? You know, it depends on the office. If you don't have the right things in the right place, the system on the other side is built to reject, right? So they're looking for a certain rule. The reason to reject. The reason to reject. So if you don't have all the things in the right places, you're going to have a really high rate of rejection. If you Even if, if you have everything in the right places, how often do you get rejected? Still a lot. Still okay. a lot of it. So, yeah. so you're, you're fighting the tide. And, and even, on prior authorization. Not even about the acceptance or rejection, just the process of getting the stuff where it needs to be mm -hmm. to even get to the rejection. Or so rejection. I know that you, in your practice, have been using Durham GPT mm -hmm. uh, with, with prior authorizations. Can you talk about how it helps? You know, the lowest yield thing you could do is, let's say you get a denial letter have it write your letters, right? That's like the, response. that is that is the, the the quickest, you know, where a letter might take you many minutes, you know, tens of minutes, you could do in 30 seconds. So but that but it also, better. it also can do the research on your behalf. And on the other and hand, supplement it. Supplement it, make it a better sounding letter. On the other hand, what it can help you do is, let's say you forget what the criteria are or the step through for a certain medicine, because for prior auth, you never want to fail. You want to have everything in the right place initially. So if you need help with your note, it can help you write, you know, make sure you have this in there, right. get this. So um it it like I said, it's just it's not necessarily something that's you know revolutionary. It's just the mundane things in life that you, either you have it in your head right now that you can think of or you don't. And doctors triage things in the office as kind of like easy tasks, medium tasks and hard tasks. Things that seem easy to us, like let's say a, a really simple medication refill, that's easy. I'm going to click, it's going to get refilled and I move on. Then there's medium to hard tasks where your brain perceives that this is going to take me a little bit of time to do it. Sure. So you just like you read the message and then we like un you know, read it, you know, like make it unread and you keep it till later. But what happens is you do that multiple times through the and day. And it piles up. Right. Piles up. End of the day, you're exhausted trying to deal with this stuff, what we call pajama time, where we actually track our physicians from 5 to 6 p.m. to 10, 11, sometimes midnight. Oh, Doctors are on, you know, doing That's these brutal. things. Brutal. And no wonder they're burnt out, right? And then, so they're putting this off, but not only that, you're going to get to it later, then your staff gets to it later. So it delays patient care too. And, and on top of making the doctor. So my, care. so it's, it's a uh, compounded. Problem. My expectation is, and, and and by the way, let me ask you a question on prioritizations. When you have used Therm GPT mm -hmm. to respond, how much has, overall would you say the odds of, of getting approval go up? So, so that's the thing, right? So one, you're getting stuff out faster. So you're taking your medium to hard task to a less than 30 second easy task. So mm -hmm. you do it right then and there and it's done. Mm -hmm. The more you do it that way too, you just kind of learn to get into the habit of, no, let me make my note correct right now. Versus right. sometimes you might sign your note and then later you're trying to do denials and all that. So you're doing all of it from the get-go correctly. You're getting a note done really fast, which is a task in itself. You're getting all the right things you need in the note right then and there. So all of these are now easy tasks done off your off your plate. And on top of what you said, like the approvals are going to be faster. So you're going to have less denial letters on the other hand that you would be using AI. So I think overall, it's fair to say if, if adopted by the medical community, yeah. this can improve the quality of your life it can improve patient care dramatically and it can provide bandwidth for you yeah. uh, and your colleagues to be able to focus on higher level challenges as opposed to exactly yeah just... i think i think this is this is kind of what i talk about a lot at the at our meetings too it, it's you know there's totally the other side of ai with diagnostics and drug discovery and and all these things that it's going to help with but what we what it can do today for us already because we've proven it can do it 
It can already knock off, let's say, three to four hours of in-basket time and note writing. It can knock that down to less than 30 minutes for you. So those hours gained, you choose to do what you will with it, right? One option is not sit at your computer from 6 to 10 p.m. Go do anything else other than that. The other is add patience if you want. Uh, go do research if you want. You know, like you said, creating that bandwidth to do whatever else you want in, in, in your life. So so in, uh, in closing, yeah. is there any... Our audience out there, do you think there's any lingering questions that we haven't discussed? You know, I think in the end, it does come down to the trust thing. You know, I think one question that's been asked, uh, like there are uh, AI scribing tools and things like that. And physicians still fear, you know, that they have to really proofread things easily, which, you know, which they always have to proofread anything. But there is that fear of is AI going to do something crazy, and and I and I always like to tell them that like AI is not some magical thing, right? These are machine models, and they will know what we tell it to know, which is also could be a problem. We didn't really go into bias, but if you kind of put bias kind of information in there, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's just demystifying that you know there, it's not aliens from above with with machines. You know, it's it's really it's 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 man built. It has superseded our expectations because. We know if you give something enough language, it will have higher cognitive powers, like human beings, right? Like we were cavemen and then we learned language and then we, we became, you know, really intelligent. But it just, there is the mystery around it. Which yeah. I think for engineers, it might not exist as much because you guys are hands Well, even everything. for us, it does exist, right? So, you know, again, everybody has their own experience. You know, I my answer to that is trust but verify, right? Just like with anything else. Um, but once you verify over and over again and you see that it, hey, it's working pretty well, it's working pretty well, the trust is built, mm -hmm. right? And so at some point, you don't have to verify every single thing. Maybe you spot check things, right? Um, I would say the best analogy I can use is if you're a Tesla driver, right? There is this autopilot or self-driving feature that Tesla has. And depending on who the driver is, there's people who live by it and use it every day and they, they can't drive without it, you know, me being one of them. Um, and and there's people who, like, I will never use it. I will never trust it, right? And so there's people in this technology adoption cycle. There's there's people who are kind of the uh, early adopters, mm -hmm. right? They jump on the bandwagon. They were the first ones with the, uh, you know, with, you know, with the cool technology. But there's sometimes uh, challenges where early adopters also end up with uh, arrows in their rear ends. Yeah. <laughs> we, all, we all know the story of the guy who was reading a newspaper, while the Tesla was on autopilot and it didn't see a a, a, a trailer or something in front of it and went under it and the guy was like beheaded. So oh, no, you can, look and you lo literally <laughs> lose your head. But once the, those early adopters kind of uh, really make the technology yeah. ready, um, then the and then the pragmatists start kicking in and they start trusting. And then the more pragmatists get on and they talk to their colleagues, oh, wait, if he's doing it, if she's doing it, I'm definitely going to do it because I, I know she's already... Just checked everything, right? Yes. I know. so so it it becomes one of those things where the the market starts adopting and adopting and adopting, and and then eventually the market gets to that that plateau of productivity, right? Um, you don't have to be the first one. The only thing that I can tell you is, um, if you if you don't take advantage of it mm -hmm. and gain an advantage from it, somebody else will, and somebody else will leapfrog you, right? Yes. Um, and so, you know, it's it's always fine to sit and wait, but there is an, a, there is a moment at which you got to say, wait a minute, like I'm, maybe I'm sitting too long, right? Or is this going to wash over me? And is this going to leave me behind? And my recommendation is for anybody who has any fear of the technology, just, get, just start using generative AI in your personal life, right? I'm sure everybody is in some form or sort. Use it for your personal life. See how much trust you can gain in it. See how many times it makes a mistake. See how well it works. And then maybe that'll warm you up to maybe using it in your professional life. Um, and, you know, and, and so it, you know, you know, again, I'm in technology and I don't, I'm not saying I trust it with everything, right? I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm using it, testing it on a daily basis, probably a thousand times a day. Um, to make sure that it behaves the, properly and, and and it's producing the right output and right outcome for the various business problems. And I see how often it can make a mistake. Um, but that doesn't take away from its power. Right. It can do things that no other technology in human history has been able to do. It's this ability to, to read your 
question, regardless of how you type it in, understand it, yeah, and then respond to it intelligently and come up with a response that you would be hard pressed to come up with yourself with its depth and breadth of knowledge. That is a magical power. That is something that we've never had before. It's a game changer. Is it going to take your job away? You know, if you're an expert in an industry, I I wouldn't fear that. If you leverage it, you can leapfrog the others in your industry. That's very you true. can leave them behind. But my guess is those who fear it are going to be probably the ones that are going to be washed over by it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think AI is here. It's the future. It's actually a lot of the solutions to a lot of our current medical problems. And healthcare right now is at a brink where there are a lot of pressures on it. So I think adopting something like this is just something, you know, all physicians have to do. So thank you so much, Fedron. That was, it was so fair. great having you. And thank you for all the tools you're building. Oh, I don't course. think people realize how much the engineers are doing on the back end <laughs> to make all of our lives better. Um, and especially in healthcare, I think these large language models are going to be fantastic. So Super. thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Future of Dermatology podcast. Remember to hit that subscribe button and share the podcast with your friends. The more you share and subscribe, the more we'll be able to grow and share our dermatology knowledge. If you have burning dermatology questions, feel free to leave them in the comment below and we would love to address them in a future episode. And please note that this podcast is not intended to substitute for medical advice from your doctor.